Chapter 16 of Initials Only. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Initials Only by Anna Catherine Green. Book 2, as seen by Detective Sweetwater. Chapter 16. Opposed. There was a new tenant in the Hicks Street tenement. He arrived late one afternoon and was shown two rooms, one in the rear building and another in the front one. Both were on the fourth floor. He demurred at the former, thought it gloomy, but finally consented to try it. The other, he said, was too expensive. The janitor, new to the business, was not much taken with him and showed it, which seemed to offend the newcomer, who was evidently an irritable fellow, owing to ill health. However, they came to terms, as I have said, and the man went away, promising to send in his belongings the next day. He smiled as he said this, and the janitor, who had rarely seen such a change take place in a human face, looked uncomfortable for a moment, and seemed disposed to make some remark about the room they were leaving. But, thinking better of it, locked the door and led the way downstairs. As the prospective tenant followed, he may have noticed, probably did, that the door they had just left was a new one, the only new thing to be seen in the whole shabby place. The next night that door was locked on the inside. The young man had taken possession. As he put away the remnants of a meal he had cooked for himself, he cast a look at his surroundings and imperceptibly sighed. Then he brightened again, and sitting down in his solitary chair, he turned his eyes on the window, which, uncurtained and without shade, stared open-mouthed, as it were, at the opposite wall rising high across the court. In that wall one window only seemed to interest him, and that was on a level with his own. The shade of this window was up but there was no light back of it, and so nothing of the interior could be seen. But his eye remained fixed upon it, while his hand, stretched out towards the lamp burning near him, held itself in readiness to lower the light at a minute's notice. Did he see only the opposite wall in that unillumined window? Was there no memory of the time when, in a previous contemplation of those dismal panes, he beheld stretching between them and himself a long, low bench with a plain wooden tub upon it, from which a dripping cloth beat out upon the boards beneath, a dismal note, monotonous as the ticking of a clock. One might judge that such memories were indeed his from the rapid glance he cast behind him at the place where the bed had stood in those days. It was placed differently now. But if he saw, and if he heard these suggestions from the past, he was not less alive to the exactions of the present for, as his glance flew back across the court, his finger suddenly moved, and the flame it controlled sputtered and went out. At the same instant the window opposite sprang into view as the lamp was lit within, and for several moments the whole interior remained visible, the books, the work-table, the cluttered furniture, and, most interesting of all, its owner and occupant. It was upon the latter that the newcomer fixed his attention, and with an absorption equal to that he saw expressed in the continents opposite. But his was the absorption of watchfulness, that of the other of introspection. Mr. Brotherson, we will no longer call him a dun even here where he is known by no other name, had entered the room clad in his heavy overcoat, and, not having taken it off before lighting his lamp, still stood with it on, gazing eagerly down at the model occupying the place of honor on the large central table. He was not touching it, not at this moment, but that his thoughts were with it, that his whole mind was concentrated on it, was evident to the watcher across the court. And as this watcher took in this fact, and noticed the loving care with which the enthusiastic inventor finally put out his finger to rearrange a thread or twirl a wheel, his disappointment found utterance in a sigh which echoed sadly through the dull and cheerless room. Had he expected this stern and self-contained man to show an open indifference to work and the hopes of a lifetime? If so, this was the first of many surprises awaiting him. He was gifted, however, with the patience of an automaton, and continued to watch his fellow-tenant as long as the latter's shade remained up. When it fell, he rose and took a few steps up and down, but not with the celerity and precision which usually accompanied his movements. Doubt disturbed his mind, and impeded his activity. He had caught a fair glimpse of Brotherson's face as he approached the window, and though it continued to show abstraction, it equally displayed serenity and a complete satisfaction with the present, if not with the future. Had he mistaken his man after all? Was his instinct, for the first time in his active career, wholly at fault? 
He had succeeded in getting a glimpse of his quarry in the privacy of his own room, at home with his thoughts and unconscious of any espionage. And how had he found him? Cheerful and natural in all his movements. But the evening was young. Retrospect comes with later and more lonely hours. There will be opportunities yet for studying this impassive countenance under much more telling and productive circumstances than these. He would await these opportunities with cheerful anticipation. Meanwhile, he would keep up the routine watch he had planned for this night. Something might yet occur. At all events, he would have exhausted the situation from this standpoint. And so it came to pass that at an hour when all the other hard-working people in the building were asleep, or at least striving to sleep, these two men still sat at their work, one in the light, the other in the darkness, facing each other, consciously to the one, unconsciously to the other, across the hollow well of the now silent court. Eleven o'clock. Twelve. No change on Brotherson's part or in Brotherson's room, but a decided one in the place where Sweetwater sat. Objects which had been totally indistinguishable even to his penetrating eye could now be seen in the ever-brightening outline. The moon had reached the open space above the court, and he was getting the full benefit of it, but it was a benefit he would have been glad to dispense with. Darkness was like a shield to him. He did not feel quite sure that he wanted this shield removed, with no curtain to the window and no shade, and all this brilliance pouring into the room, he feared the disclosure of his presence there, or, if not that, some effect on his own mind of those memories he was more anxious to see mirrored in another's discomfiture than in his own. Was it to escape any lack of concentration which those same memories might bring, that he rose and stepped to the window? Or was it under one of those involuntary impulses which move us in spite of ourselves to do the very thing our judgment disapproves? No sooner had he approached the sill than Mr. Brotherson's shade flew way up and he too looked out. Their glances met, and for an instant the hardy detective experienced that involuntary stagnation of the blood which follows an inner shock. He felt that he had been recognized. The moonlight lay full upon his face, and the other had seen and known him else why the constrained attitude and sudden rigidity observable in this confronting figure with its partially lifted hand. A man like Brotherson makes no pause in any action, however trivial, without a reason. Either he had been transfixed by this glimpse of his enemy on watch, or, daring thought, had seen enough of sepulchral suggestion in the wan face looking back from this fatal window to shake him from his composure and let loose the grinning devil of remorse from its iron prison-house? If so, the movement was a memorable one, and the hazard quite worth while. He had gained no, he had gained nothing. He had been the fool of his own wishes. No one, let alone Brotherson, could have mistaken his face for that of a woman. He had forgotten his newly grown beard. Some other cause must be found for the other's attitude. It savored of shock, if not fear. If it were fear, then had he roused an emotion which might rebound upon himself in sharp reprisal? Death had been known to strike people standing where he stood, mysterious death of a species quite unrecognizable. What warranty had he that it would not strike him, and now? None. Yet it was Brotherson who moved first. With a shrug of the shoulder plainly visible to the man opposite, he turned away from the window and without lowering the shade, began gathering up his papers for the night, and later banking up his stove with ashes. Sweetwater, with a breath of decided relief, stepped back and threw himself on the bed. It had really been a trial for him to stand there under the other's eye, though his mind refused to formulate his fear, or to give him any satisfaction when he asked himself what there was in the situation suggested of death to the woman, or harm to himself. Nor did morning light bring counsel, as is usual in similar cases. He felt the mystery more in the hubbub and restless turmoil of the day than in the night's silence and inactivity. He was glad when the stroke of six gave him an excuse to leave the room, and gladder yet when in doing so he ran upon an old woman from a neighboring room, who no sooner saw him than she leered at him and eagerly remarked, "'Not much sleep, eh? We didn't think you'd like it. Did you see anything?' Now this gave him the one excuse he wanted. "'See anything,' he repeated, apparently with all imaginable innocence. "'What do you mean by that?' "'Don't you know what happened in that room?' 
"'Don't tell me!' he shouted out. "'I don't want to hear any nonsense. I haven't time. I've got to be at the shop at seven, and I don't feel very well. What did happen?' he mumbled, and drawing off, just loud enough for the woman to hear. Something unpleasant, I'm sure. Then he ran downstairs. At half-past six he found the janitor. He was, to all appearance, in a state of great excitement, and he spoke very fast. "'I won't stay another night in that room,' he loudly declared, breaking in where the family were eating breakfast by lamplight. "'I don't want to make any trouble, and I don't want to give my reasons, but that room don't suit me. I'd rather take the dark one you talked about yesterday. Here's the money. Have my things moved to-day, will ye?' "'But your moving out after one night's stay will give that room a bad name,' stammered the janitor, rising awkwardly. "'There'll be talk, and I won't be able to let that room all winter.' "'Nonsense! Every man hasn't the nerves I have. You'll let it in a week. But let or not let, I'm going front into the little dark room. I'll get the boss to let me off at half-past four. So that's settled.' He waited for no reply, and got none. But when he appeared promptly at a quarter to five, he found his few belongings moved into the middle room on the fourth floor of the front building, which, oddly perhaps, chanced to be next door to the one he had held under watch the night before. The first page of his adventure in the Hick Street tenement had been turned, and he was ready to start upon another. End of chapter 16